Good morning and welcome to Farm Factor. I'm your host, Jamie Bloom. On today's show, Dwayne Taves is joined by Darren Dunlop with Dunlop Farms, recent fertilizer advocate with the National Fertilizer Institute. Then enjoy this week's Kansas soybean update. Next, Kyle Bauer is joined by Philip Singh, CEO of the U.S. Meat Export Federation. Then it's this week's Kansas Farm Bureau update, and we'll end with Plain Talk featuring Kyle and Dwayne. Stay with us. Closed captioning brought to you by Ag Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at agpromosource.com. This segment brought to you by Kansas Farm Bureau, the voice of agriculture. To join today or more information, go to kfb.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Welcome to Farm Factor. Up first, Dwayne Taves is talking fertilizer management with Darren Dunlop with Dunlop Farming in Parker, Kansas. Dwayne Thames joining you once again here on Ag AM in Kansas and an opportunity to catch up with Darren Dunlop with uh, Dunlop Farms uh, with the National uh, Fertilizer Institute uh, at Commodity Classic. They were uh, uh, named one of the advocates, uh, the 4R advocates for uh, the Fertilizer Institute. And Darren, can uh, you talk a little bit about uh, what nutrient management means uh, on you guys' operation? Uh, we're just doing grid sampling and uh, starting out with uh, getting our lime right, uh, getting our pH levels right, and then uh, you know uh, then we can do doing the same thing with the fertilizers also. And uh, you know, on the nitrogen, we're just kind of feeding it out a little bit at a time, you know, so it don't get washed away or. So we think about uh, that application. Uh, farming's gotten a lot more prescriptive in how we utilize fertilizer uh, to really meet that crop need at the time. Yes. So talking a little bit about the Fertilizer Institute, uh, their 4R program is right source, right rate, right time, and right place. How have you guys incorporated that on your farm? Well, it started out with the lime, done the grid sampling, so we could... Uh, you know, if you uh, if you do the grid sampling, it the the it'll the lime will save you enough to pay for the grid sampling, and then from there, you you variable rate the fertilizer and get it in the right place. So my understanding is that uh, as one of the award winners on the 4R program of the Fertilizer Institute that you'll get a chance to advocate and, and talk to growers uh, around the region about uh, opportunities to, to be better managers and stewards of nutrients. Yes. Have they told you anything about uh, what that program uh, is going to entail? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's just the, the right source and the right place, and the right time and right rate. As far as uh, where you look for your operation to go in the future, uh, Darren, uh, do you see additional things that, that your operation is likely to adopt in the future? Well, we're, we're getting into some variable rate planning and different things, so yes. As, so as field mapping and yield maps have been a part of that uh, discussion to, to make those decisions on, on what parts of the field uh, maybe are more productive than others? Yeah, we've uh, we've got probably 15 years uh, of uh, yield maps that our uh, Jason Sutterby's helping us with, and they're helping make us out some prescriptions, planning prescriptions, and variable rate. And I mean, they do all the variable rating on the fertilizer too. Our thanks to Darren Dunlop uh, from uh, Kansas, uh, an opportunity to catch up with them as part of the Fertilizer Institute's 4R uh, nutrient management uh, program to advocate about responsible use of uh, nutrients in farm and ag operations. Jamie, we'll send it back to you. Thanks, Dwayne. Folks, come back after these messages for this week's Kansas Soybean Update.
KFRM is one of the largest farm radio stations in the nation, dedicated to informing and entertaining rural listeners from northern Oklahoma to southwestern Nebraska. You can catch KFRM in many ways. Of course, 550 on the AM dial, streaming at KFRM.com, or on your smartphone by going to the TuneIn Radio app, or on Ag AM in Kansas on Tuesdays, and Facebook every day of the week. KFRM, tune us in. You'll be glad you did. Hi, I'm Randy. And I'm Paul from PFI. We would like to personally invite you to stop by PFI, home of Boot Daddies. PFI is America's Western store, covering over 50,000 square feet. Over 25,000 boots. Visit Saddle City with the largest selection of saddles and tack anywhere. A huge selection of hats at Big Spur Hat Company in PFI Town. And choose from the best brands of clothing and accessories for the entire family. PFI, located on Highway 65 at the Battlefield Exit in Springfield. And I'm not kidding. This segment is brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Welcome back to Farm Factor and the Kansas Soybean Update. This is the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Jared Nash, who farms near Parsons, joins us. And Jared, you and your wife, Kimmy, are a part of the DuPont Young Leader Program for 2018. And you just completed phase two of the program recently at the Commodity Classic in Anaheim. Yes, we did. So what were some of the things involved uh, during phase two of that program? They, uh had some lady come out and talk to us about leadership training, telling us how to convey our message and being able to talk to people and kind of defend our industry versus the people that are anti-ag. And then they had another lady present on business etiquette, on how to dress and how to act and in a professional manner was the two big presentations that they had. From when you started this program back in Johnston, Iowa during phase one and going through phase two of the program itself, how much more confident are you and your wife with regards to that on being able to go out and, and represent the soybean industry? It helped us out tremendously. Well, my wife was better at it than I was, but I am more suited to be able to go out in public and talk in front of people and to different people and sectors in the industry. Why is it important for farmers to be spokespeople for the industry? So people can understand our way of life and that we're not out to hurt people because our families eat and drink the same food and water that everybody else does and we're not going to harm ourselves and you know let alone anybody else so i think it's important to go defend our way of life the camaraderie and friends that you have made with your fellow class members is equally as important knowing you've got people around the country you can talk to now too and that was kind of the eye opener there's several people from the east coast that grew soybeans that i was not aware of that they grew soybeans like in delaware and that way, if there's something going on in different parts of the country where the other people were from, that we can call and get information on what's going on in their states or regions. If you had a chance to talk with other producers in Kansas, why would you tell them they should apply to be a part of this program? If they don't think that they can go out and talk to people and be able to convey a message that's pro-ag or anything for that matter, that this program really developed the leadership skills it takes and speaking skills that it takes to go out and do that. That is Jared Nash, who farms near Parsons, Kansas, as he and his wife, Kimmy, are a part of the DuPont Young Leader Program, and he joins us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. The Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. Learn more at kansassoybeans.org. For Kansas Soybeans, I'm Greg Akagi. Hope you enjoyed this week's Kansas Soybean Update. Stay with us after the break for more with Kyle Bauer, reporting from Commodity Classic in Anaheim, California. What if U.S. soybean oil were an industry sensation? If end users started asking for it by name? That future is here, the time is now. To meet customer demands, the Soybean Checkoff is investing in varieties that produce oil with increased functionality. A message from the Kansas Soybean Commission, the Soybean Checkoff, progress powered by Kansas farmers. All over the country, 
More and more communities are making the change to biodiesel, made from U.S. soybean oil. And the decision continues, improving the health and welfare for millions of Americans, while adding billions to our national economy. What does a brighter, more sustainable future look like in our cities and towns, and how do we get there? When New York needed an alternative fuel source to reduce carbon emissions, the city found what it needed in biodiesel made from U.S. soybean oil. Ag Promo Source is a unique group of marketing specialists with one mission, help your ag business grow. Each affiliate has their own area of expertise and they work together to bring you advice, products, and services. To get started, visit agpromosource.com. Ag Promo Source, together we grow. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. Valley Vet Supply. This segment brought to you by SureCrop. Liquid crop nutrition delivered right to your farm. We're back. Now let's talk U.S. meat exports with Kyle Bauer and Philip Singh with the U.S. Meat Export Federation. Hi, this is Kyle Bauer reporting from Anaheim, California. I have the opportunity to visit with Philip Singh. He's CEO Emeritus of the U.S. Meat Export Federation. Philip, if you would uh, let folks know what the U.S. Meat Export Federation does. Well, the U.S. Meat Export Federation is a federation that works to promote U.S. beef, pork, and lamb in the international marketplace. Uh, we were started about 40 years ago, just a year and a half ago. We celebrate our 40th anniversary. And uh, we've uh, worked uh, basically with uh, in about 100 countries uh, all over the, the world and in practically every hemisphere and in every continent. And uh, we're comprised of a, a diversity of memberships. So we have the beef and the pork and the lamb industry. We also have basically packers, exporters. Uh, we have processors, purveyors and traders. Uh, we also are comprised of corn and soybean producers. Uh, those organizations basically understand the value of, of the feeding the cattle, feeding the, feeding the pork, and how, what, a, what a market is, the, the cattle industry and the pork industry is for U.S. grain. And then we also have agribusiness interests, for example, and also like uh, farm organizations. So we're an amalgam of a lot of different organizations coming together for the single purpose of trying to export more product. And it's been very successful over the last 40 years. Uh, just last year alone, we, we almost exported $14 billion worth of, uh, of, of product internationally. So uh, it's been very successful over the years. And when you break that out per animal, it's very significant on for every animal that's processed. Yeah, rounded numbers, we, we export about, if you look at our fed, a, a fed steer or fed cattle, it'd be about $250 a head would be the export dividend. If you look at pork, it'd be about $50 is the export dividend. We export about 27, 28% of our pork production. We uh, export close to 15% of our beef production. And if you took beef byproducts like hides and skins and some of these other types of things, uh, it's even more than that. It's closer to almost 20%. So it's, it's really made a difference to the profitability of the producer, uh, the fact that uh, we're exporting as much product as we are internationally. How are those trends? I mean, do we see strong demand in our foreign uh, exports? Well, I think that's really the thing right now. You're starting to see in a lot of these markets growing interest in protein. Uh, for, the, for the longest time, you've had countries that have been more cereal-based, if you will. And now as, they, as their GDP grows, as their buying power grows, they're at trending from the cereals to the proteins. So, for example, you look at Asia by the year of 2030, it's predicted that 65% of the world's middle class or the GDP will be in Asia, in the Asia Pacific. That's why TPP is so important. And so the, if we can meet that trend uh, with our protein, basically, uh, this is a, just a great place to be. So that's why we're, we're looking now at the future, and we're looking now at where some of these opportunities exist uh, far into the future. And certainly exports direct those dollars to rural communities. Uh, it, it is a value-added factory out there, those livestock facilities. Well, yes, it's, it's very value-added. I mean, we, we, we grain feed our, our beef and, and, uh, and our pork, of course, and, and, and so the, you add that value. And plus, the, the nature of the international markets are becoming more branded-oriented. They're becoming more high-value-oriented. If you go to a market like Japan and Korea, uh, they're looking at buying some of the highest prices uh, and the highest 
valued products you can produce. Uh, for example, certified Angus beef in the international market does almost twice the velocity of sales that it does in the United States because uh, there's just that, that demand that's out there. So if we have uh, market access and if we can uh, have, again, the, the, the support of our U.S. government and the support of the producers in this quest to, to move more protein internationally, I think there's infinite possibilities for producers. We're visiting with Philip Singh. He's CEO Emeritus of the U.S. Meat Export Federation. This is Kyle Bauer reporting from Anaheim. Back to you, Jamie. Thanks, Kyle. Come back after these messages for the Kansas Farm Bureau update. Welcome to Western Kansas Wildlife Travel Center. Right here in Oakley, Kansas on I-70 at exit 76. I-70, after all, is America's Main Street, and we're right here on Main Street for you. Now that I'm an Oakley resident, I still come in almost every day, and I sit and listen to the conversations of the people around me. You know, the guys who are talking about the big elf they just bagged, or the folks who are taking their kid to college for the first time. People just traveling up and down the highway. Real people, just like you and me and they find just what I find here, real people to serve them. There's history, there's scenery. We hope you'll stop and see us soon. Welcome to Oakley. Hello, I'm Dr. Frank Lyons from Kansas Regenerative Medicine Center here in Manhattan, Kansas. Daryl was one of our patients that we did about seven months ago. I dug trees by hand for years and years and years. In the process, I wore up my rotary cuff. But when I learned about this process, I thought if there's a way to get rid of this pain, then I, then I want to do it. So we did it and it worked. I'm not gonna go out and take trees with a shovel anymore, but then I can do the things that I want to do now. Well, it's been very gratifying to help people with their painful joints and other uh, entities and it's been especially gratifying to be able to help people who I know and have worked with and known for many years. This segment brought to you by Kansas Farm Bureau, the voice of agriculture. To join today or more information, go to kfb.org or find us on Facebook and Twitter. Welcome back to Farm Factor and the Kansas Farm Bureau Update. The recent round of NAFTA negotiations saw progress on agriculture issues. In Mexico City last week, negotiators wrapped up discussions regarding sanitary and phytosanitary measures, according to American Farm Bureau Federation economist Veronica Nye. Those are basically the scientific rules that govern trade in plants and animals. That chapter actually closed. And that means negotiations are finished. And when we spoke with the U.S. negotiators, they were pretty happy with the results that they got out of Canada and Mexico. Nye says the NAFTA chapter on technical barriers to trade, including things such as labeling, is close to being finished. However, she says there is much work yet to do regarding market access. We've had a lot of concerns about the access the U.S. dairy farmers and poultry producers have in Canada. We've asked Canada to give a significant new availability to send our products to their customers. And so far, we're having quite a lot of resistance to that. So that will probably be one of those topics that is concluded at the very end because it is such a thorny issue for our Canadian friends. Negotiators previously planned to conclude negotiations by the end of this month. However, another round of talks is scheduled in April, and Nye tells farmers and ranchers not to expect NAFTA to be finished this year. I think it's well known that Mexico has a presidential election this summer. U.S. midterms are in November and will have an impact because the legislators tend to not want to vote on free trade agreements in any country during an election cycle. So I think it's safe to say that we're not expecting a concluded NAFTA by the end of 2018 at this given point. Michael Clements, Washington. Stay with us. We'll be back after the break with Plain Talk. 
Sure Crop Fertilizers was started by my father, Don Sherman, and my mother, Shirley Sherman. Family business has started in the 80s. We predominantly focus on plant nutrients and what we can do to give growers better responses for with the fertilizer dollars that they do and what we can do to you know, make those things work better for the grower. We're based out of Seneca, Kansas. We work with growers in their soil analysis to figure out what they need and then we can put those in a blend that gives them the best results and so that we can deliver that direct to their farm so that they have those nutrients where they need them, when they need them, and so that they can apply them in a manner that's, that's very efficient to them and, and works well on their planting systems and what they're doing. Sure Crop Fertilizers has been around for a long time. We always say we're, we're big enough to take care of everything you need, but we're small enough to do it quickly. You can get a hold of us at 1-800-635-4743. Um, our website is surecropfertilizers.com. And you can always email me at corey at surecropfertilizers.com. And with any questions you have, we'd be glad to answer and work with you. Next time you see a beautiful field of corn, reach out and thank the farmers who work tirelessly to raise corn for livestock feed, renewable fuels, and exports to feed a growing world population. The farmers on the Kansas Corn Commission work for Kansas Corn with grower-funded checkoff dollars that support foreign and domestic market development, research, promotion, and education to expand opportunities for Kansas farmers. To learn more, visit kscorn.com. Welcome to our bar B, 8,000 plus square feet Western store with something for everyone in the family. We have boots, belts, hats, jeans, anything you could want to outfit you and your horse. Come visit our line of saddles. We have 400 plus new and used saddles in stock. We offer tack, grooming supplies, head stalls, breast collars, you name it, we've got it for you and your horse. That's our bar B, one mile east of Highway 4 on Northeast 39th. Our bar B, where Western is a way of life. This segment brought to you by Kansas Corn. Learn more at kscorn.com. Welcome back. Now let's see what Kyle and Dwayne are up to on Plain Talk. Hi, this is Kyle Bauer with Plain Talk with Dwayne Allen Taves. Kyle Bauer, your fact or fiction question of the day. The liver of a seal is poisonous to humans. Fact or fiction? Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Well, why would it be? I'm trying to think what seals eat. Seals eat fish. Dun, dun, a lot of times dun, you pull the... Dun, dun, the <laughs> you're stalling. The, yeah, I'm saying fiction. It is uh, fiction. It's actually the liver of a polar bear. Contains huh. so much vitamin A. Wow. That uh, From eating all those seals. <laughs> Evidently, <laughs> seals all, are high well, they're white they? and they're so close to the sun. It's all that sunshine the polar bear. You gets. said vitamin what? A? A. I guess that's K that has to do with sunshine. I no. was going to say K block. Vitamin A. Vitamin D. A is about D. Well, you know, there's now people yelling, confused. yelling at their television right yeah. now. Okay. That's, well, that's I, right. next time I shoot a polar bear, I will not eat. Don't his eat the liver. liver. All right. Bauer. It's got too much vitamin A. Huh. More How about than, you? Are you going to eat it? How about no. if you have a seal? Are you going to eat it as a seal? You I don't eat think, liver at all, do you? I can tolerate. I'm not really? a huge fan. I invited you out to eat lunch, and no, you wouldn't even go with me. You did not. I did, too. No, it was when you went coyote hunting that you went and ate liver and I, onions. I was here at work. You had to be the only person in the whole world I didn't you, ask to go eat liver and onions. I, I asked every person I could think of. There was a restaurant that, he was gonna, that had a special. They had liver uh, and onions. And I asked everybody I could possibly know... And and nobody was like, yeah. Uh, I'm onion. thinking if it's got enough onions, I can probably tolerate it. Yeah, and that's <laughs> onions with a G, not onions without a G. Right. Yeah, so, my way. My way of eating. Yeah. My well, way of eating. And it. this was different in that it had gravy on it and the onions. Okay. It had brown gravy on it. And, and okay. I'd never had it. Now, to be honest, we're not with brown gravy on it. And when I, I go that's... next time, I'm going to ask to leave the brown gravy off uh -huh. and just more onions. Huh. Um, but perfectly honestly, with the brown gravy on it and the onions. Couldn't taste the liver at all. No, except that, you know, <laughs> most people, the taste is mouthfeel, and you still have the same mouthfeel. Mm. So, well, I eat chicken livers twice a year. Okay. Because it see, takes I me love six months gizzards. to forget that I don't, don't like them. Don't like them. them. Yeah. Um, I eat gizzards regularly i buy them over here at the grocery store and cooked oh yeah not raw not raw yeah cooked and um 
Because I like to fight for my meal. I don't like it to just be something that, you know, you don't have to actually get a sense of accomplishment right. in, in working I'm on I'm thinking it. by the time you get done chewing them, it's probably one of those calorie-negative foods. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Jamie Lewin, and I hope you enjoyed today's show. See you next week on Farm Factor. Closed captioning brought to you by Egg Promo Source. Together we grow. Learn more at eggpromosource.com.